Okay, welcome to uh, a little preview video of Enter the Alien. Um, if you follow my channel or you follow my social media, uh, then you're probably already aware that uh, recently, um, I think there was a huge announcement for Philosophy Portal, which is a website I run, uh, and you can check out the link in the description, philosophyportal.online. It's a uh, uh, and say an online university, which is trying to teach the foundations of modern philosophy, focused on phenomenology, psychoanalysis, existentialism. And uh, just recently, um, the culmination of the first class through Philosophy Portal, focused on teaching Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, released the first anthology, um, which is a collection of papers and edited work um, which was produced as a collective effort. It was produced um, from many of the students in the class submitting their own papers and also some close collaborators who submitted their own papers, including my philosophical mentor, Alexander Bard, as well as a close collaborator, Daniel Garner, uh, perhaps better known as O.G. Rose, who helped me to edit the anthology and create a sense of a, a totality. Um, and the title of the anthology, Enter the Alien, might at first sound strange um, for a book about Hegel, who's often thought of as a, of course, the culmination of German idealism um, and one of the most important philosophers of the modern world. Um, the reason why I chose the title Enter the Alien is because throughout my readings of Hegel, um, I have come to see his concept of alienation as a potentially interesting one to interpret in a slightly different way in the 21st century, and also inspired by my readings of Slavoj Žižek, which I'll get more into as I take you on this preview of the book. Um, was inspired to take a look at the 21st century as if through alien eyes. Um, and I think Hegel offers an interesting starting point for that um, work. And I suppose that's really what the anthology as a totality is trying to communicate. So, I mean, uh, who is this book for? I mean, this book is for people who are perhaps new to philosophy, who are perhaps struggling to make sense in a systemic way um, of the complexities of our time, of the challenges of our time, and are um, willing to expose themselves to something which is extremely dense and, and itself challenging, but with the hope that on the other side of that, that hard work, which is also my experience reading Hegel, that you get almost a new release um, and a capacity as a consciousness, as a thinking being to, um, let's say, navigate or metabolize um, the 21st century world. Um, so I think with that as a preface, I just want to um, take you through the site here. So this is on philosophyportal.online. Um, you can see underneath the books tab, you'll see the, the link for enter the alien. So you just wanna click on that and you'll be brought to this page. Um, and the, the cover is something I designed. It's, it's of course, um, meant to evoke um, a sense of something alien. There are archetypal alien ships hovering above um, an archetypal image of the global internet, the earth as a totality now um, covered by a digital web, a digital network. And and in some sense, that's inspired from my PhD thesis cover, which was just the earth with a sort of overlay of the global brain, the global, which my PhD thesis was titled Global Brain Singularity. And 
I see in some sense this turn towards Hegel and this turn towards modern philosophy as um, almost a gesture of bringing modern philosophy to the global brain, bringing modern philosophy to uh, the complexity sciences, interdisciplinary studies, um, fields of this nature, which are attempting to make sense of the whole, um, but which in my experience and my readings um, could use a better foundation. Um, that is a foundation in my point of view uh, with phenomenology, existentialism, psychoanalysis, um, and, uh, and, and in that process, not negating, for example, any of the modern sciences, but rather trying to bring the subject fully into the picture. Um, and so that's also a, a larger part of my um, academic mission, let's say. So over here, you see uh, four buttons. Um, one is a link which will take you straight to the Amazon page where you can purchase a copy. Uh, here is a free preview. Uh, here is a link to a conference that was held at the end of the course where all of the articles in the anthology also have a presentation as a po uh, except for the paper by Alexander Bard. Um, so if you're interested in exposing yourself to um, the characters and the people behind these articles, that's the place to go and you can sort of see them um, explore their ideas in a presentation format. And then there's the student access portal where um, the students who have a, uh, who were in the course, uh, both those who submitted articles and those who were um, simply taking the course um, have access to the whole thing um, for free. But I'm gonna take you through the free preview. Um, and in taking you through the full preview, the free preview, um, just sort of maybe explain a little bit what went into designing Enter the Alien. Um, the care, the attention, the love um, that went into this, and um, maybe also uh, encourage you to pick up a copy yourself and really see what this anthology has to offer. I think it is of incredibly high quality. So here you can see, uh, I'm going to get more into the Slavoj Žižek endorsement on a later page, but yeah, here's just the, the cover. Um, First thing here is, yeah, I would like to just first, yeah, thank, of course, Alexander Bard, who wrote the introduction, which really frames um, this, this anthology well, I think, with the idea of the Hegel event. And Daniel Garner, we put in many, many hours um, editing this, this work and, and trying to bring it towards a point of uh, not just sort of an aesthetic cohesion and stylistic cohesion, but also um, a, 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 a design a structural design which would um, make sure that when people read this book as a whole, it's not just a collection of um, a collection of articles, but uh, but uh, really a, a a work as a totality, and and dedicated for absolute knowers. For those of you who don't know, absolute knowing is a is a fundamental concept in Hegel. It is the last chapter of the phenomenology of spirit. And it's a standpoint of cognition or a standpoint of spirit, um, which is really the, both the simple essence or the simple notion of spirit and also the culmination of a long developmental process, um, a life process um, where spirit um, undergoes metamorphoses through largely contradictions and dialectical processes, contradictions governed by dialectical processes, um, which um, move through different shapes, which Hegel calls consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, spirit, religion, and absolute knowing. And I think that that series of shapes, understanding the contradictions which structure those series of shapes is, I argue in the anthology, a precondition for thinking in the 21st century. And I think a lot of the culture wars or um, antagonisms, which structure a lot of contemporary society are a result of spirit not really understanding the recapitulation of its developmental structure in every newborn spirit, so to speak. Okay, so next we have, uh, here's a, a, 
a, a quote by, by Slavoj Žižek, which um, I found inspiring. And the reason why I added it was because I think it goes so nicely with the theme, Enter the Alien. So maybe I'll read it and describe what I'm, why I included it here. He said, I'm not comparing myself with Hegel, but at least at some level, we have something in common. Are people aware that when Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel's masterpiece, when it first appeared, it was dismissed by many critics as a totally confused work, where Hegel jumps from one example to another, mixing culture, religion, history, philosophical, logical, psychological, scientific ideas as a totally confused mixture, and so on. So there is already something of a jumping from one example to another in Hegel's way of thinking. Before I go on, I just want to say that he's here sort of comparing the way in which the public received the phenomenology of spirit, which is, of course, the book that the class was and this anthology is inspired by, with the way in which the public received him as a philosopher when he first emerged onto the scene. And in many ways, the way in which the whole academic structure received him, which was as a confused thinker who is unable to formulate himself, clearly jumping from one idea to another. But he's sort of um, suggesting that the perception of both himself and Hegel, namely what they share as philosophical figures, is that they both rupture the coordinates of the contemporary ideology. And in rupturing the coordinates of the temporary of the contemporary ideology, they appear to be a totally confused mixture. But in fact, there is an order in their thinking, which only requires deep study. <laughs> and and that's that's a bar that many people who are critical of both Hegel and Zizek, um, and some people who are just critical of Zizek, maybe Hegelians who are critical of Zizek, um, will not uh, attempt to pass. Um, it's, it's something that I understand because when I was in my doctorate, I put a tremendous amount of time and effort into attempting to understand the deep structure of, of Zizek's thought and, and, um, you know, what appears to be a confused mixture in Zizek is in fact, um, not as it appears, so to speak. Um, although for many people, his thinking may be confusing. So let me continue here. In this sense, I don't think that bringing aliens into it is really to bring in something strange to Hegel. Hegel is the big alien of modern philosophy, literally. I mean, it's almost a dox of contemporary philosophy, 19th century onwards, to define yourself through a distance to Hegel. It's as if we are still post-Hegelians in the sense that all versions of modern philosophy are some kind of reversal of Hegel. Like against Hegelian idealism, you emphasize concrete life. Against rationalism, you emphasize the irrationality of life, whatever. It is almost as if contemporary philosophy is anti-Hegelian, which of course I find suspicious in the sense that why do we all need Hegel? Why do we all need to build this monster, Hegel? So he's here referring to figures, of course, Deleuze comes to mind, also Nietzsche comes to mind, uh, Kierkegaard comes to mind. You know, there are many, many, many figures and I, and I, I, I go into depth uh, elaborating on that a little bit in the anthology itself, but He's basically saying there's this enormous resistance to Hegel and at the same time, this weird negative identification with Hegel in post-Hegelian philosophy or modern philosophy. And, and Zizek, as someone whose philosophy is inspired by psychoanalysis, is basically saying, and this is really one of the secrets of his entire philosophy, is he's basically saying, what is this resistance about? Um, why do all of these great philosophers from Deleuze to Foucault and on onwards, why do they um, use Hegel as this negative point of reference? And at the same time, it, it seems like almost all of modern philosopher philosophy is a, at the same time a, a working through Hegel. So there's a paradox here that 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 um, for Zizek is monstrous. And 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 I think that if you really understand just this quote, I mean, this is a good opening to the mind of, of, of Zizek. It's, a, it's an opening to how he is perceiving the last 200 plus years of philosophy, Let's more, 200, you know, 200 plus years of philosophy. Um, so uh, I thought it was also a good way to open, enter the alien, because he's saying, I, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing, you know, as, as is, rich in Zizek's work, he's bringing the concept of the alien 
into philosophy and into specifically Hegelian philosophy. And while I was reading the phenomenology of spirit over the last five years, and also while I was teaching the phenomenology of spirit throughout this year, um, that concept was, was, was fresh in my mind and um, also informing the way I was trying to uh, interpret our present moment uh, from a Hegelian point of view. Um, next, we have table of contents. So I will get into Slavoj Žižek actually uh, endorsing this work. Um, then I give a, a note on the phenomenology of spirit, which is basically um, going into uh, my uh, relationship with the text, my interpretation of the text, how I taught the course, the context in which I taught the course, and where my teaching of the course may be in some sense constrained by my historical position and my developmental position. Um, then there's an editor's note by Daniel Garner where he um, attempts to articulate the way he was approaching the assembly of this anthology as an editor. Um, and then there are author bios and article summaries and acknowledgements. And I, I will get into um, I will get into those author bios in this in this video to, to give you a sense of, of the text. Um, okay, so this is the this is the endorsement uh, from from Zizek. Uh, I was extremely <laughs> excited when 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 it came in and he 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 agreed to um, offer it because not only is it I think a really glowing endorsement, but I think the text deserves this endorsement. Uh, I think what he's saying is, is quite accurate about the text. So he says, the collective work enter the alien thinking 21st century Hegel is an extraordinary achievement. Instead of interpreting Hegel from a safe historical distance and judging what is still alive in, this, in his work, it treats Hegel as our contemporary, as a philosopher whose time has finally come today. And it is profoundly communist work, a collective endeavor in which the new picture of Hegel emerges through the interaction of multiple individual interventions. I'll just say here that I, I do think in some sense, my work strives in a communist direction. It, it, I do value, of course, I want to share my work and I want to share my ideas, but it is also important for me to be a part of an intellectual community. Uh, that was also something that I've been developing since my doctorate. Uh, my, of course, my doctoral thesis is just written by myself, but my first major work uh, after my doctorate was Sex, Masculinity, and God, which was a trialogue series with um, two other um, men my own age, where we're reflecting on sort of the, how we perceive sex, masculinity, and God. And I think that triangulation between three different identities perceiving this situation differently um, was extremely valuable on a personal level. And I think it does offer um, a, a lot uh, for men and women who, who might be interested in those topics. Um, and, and this is just a deepening of the attempt to situate an intellectual work within a, collect, a collection of um, minds and a community of minds. Um, so I think it, it does live up to that idea. For this reason, the volume should be read at least two times so that one is able to grasp how the meaning of a single text is affected by what precedes and by what follows. It is thus one of those rare works which are Hegelian already in its form. Thinking as 21st century Hegel is simply a volume about what thinking means today. So it is not a book for specialists, but a book for everyone who seriously wants to think. Um, and I really like that, that ending, um, namely like the idea that this book itself is Hegelian in its form. And I, I try to, to do that. I try to do that. I try to, I tried to design the course in such a way that it was Hegelian in its form. Um, and I tried to design this book in, 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 in a way that it's Hegelian in its form. So um, I'm glad that he saw that. And, um, and also emphasizing that it's not a book for specialists, but for anyone who wants to seriously think, this is not necessarily anti-specialist, but there is a way in which people who become too hyper-specialists uh, in a certain field, um, constrain themselves to such a degree that it, it's hard for them to um, perhaps appreciate things outside of their, their specialization. Um, I suppose the way I've gotten around that 
obstacle is that I've, there's always been a continuity in my drive as a, as a whole, but I'm always sort of moving through form in such a way as that it doesn't remain static or fixed. Um, and I, I hope also I, I, I can already see that movement in myself as it relates to Hegel. Like I'm not going to be a Hegelian scholar for like, I'm not going to identify as a Hegelian scholar and just only read Hegel for the rest of my um, existence. It's, it's, it's a moving form here. And, and there's a logic to my drive, which I can't symbolize in any one text, but which is, you know, distributed throughout my drive, let's say. Um, so yeah, that's why I sort of said at the opening of this video that this is a really good book, I think, for people who are, are, are thinkers, who are ready to start thinking, who want to shake themselves out of a particular ideology and want to expose themselves to some particularly challenging philosophy, which may be new, which may be um, uh, something which you've never encountered before. I just want to say also on this, this, this Zizek quote that at the start of chapter two of Zizek's newest book, Surplus Enjoyment, um, he actually opens that chapter by saying that today we do not need direct readings of Hegel, but we need imaginative readings of Hegel. And I think that while my course was a direct reading of Hegel, may, ne namely that the students moving through the course could understand the text phenomenology of spirit and make sense of it themselves, uh, this book, Enter the Alien, is an imaginative reading of Hegel. There's, there's, there's uh, papers on Tantra, there's papers on Buddhism, there's papers on, you know, art, there's papers on mathematics. They're all very imaginative. And uh, my paper deals with contemporary atheism. So we're dealing with topics that may not have been topics that Hegel himself wrestled with, certainly not in the context of the 21st century. And uh, that, I think, is, again, the power of the, uh, of the work. Okay, so in my note um, on the phenomenology of spirit, maybe I'll highlight a few points that um, uh, might be interesting. I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, but I want to maybe highlight some points that might be interesting. So I like that the work here, it's a, it's a recapitulation um, the form, this is the phenomenology of spirit of a developmental process which occurs in every newborn spirit. So these are the shapes here, consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, spirit, religion, absolute knowing. And I think that our culture has done a bad job of, of understanding that, um, you know, each of these shapes is something that every newborn human moves through, has to move through. You can't just, and Hegel's point was that we have to understand how this unfolds in the mind or in spirit um, in order to help spirit, bring spirit to a standpoint of absolute knowing. And uh, perhaps in particular, we have done a bad job of this as a society as it relates to the final categories here, spirit and religion. Um, I knew I know I grew up, and in some sense, my paper is a response to the cultural climate in which I grew up of, of new atheism, where I feel like there was this presupposition that if we just become rational, that all of our historical problems will be resolved, you know, and there's this deep anti-spiritualist, deep anti-religious ethos in those thought forms. Um, but... For Hegel, this is nonsensical, that you have to move through spirit, you have to move through religion, and there are deep questions about how that unfolds. Um, and the phenomenology of spirit attempts to articulate the specific contradictions which um, are experienced by spirit in its unfolding through these forms. Um, but yeah, our culture just does a bad, a bad job of understanding this. And so I, that's why I think it's, it, 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 it's a great foundation for young students to encounter this work because it helps them to understand their own notional shape. It helps them understand their own internal contradictions and situates it in a developmental process, which is ultimately leading to a, a deep simplicity um, and a simplicity which... Um, I think enables a 
greater capacity to be in such a complex world and such a alien world to use that that term um other thing maybe i should emphasize oh yeah so so my role at, at, in teaching in teaching this in, ph in philosophy portal um so I, I wanted to emphasize that i'm not teaching i didn't teach this class as a typical university professor namely to say that i wasn't teaching this on an annual routine as a demand from the requirement of a university body to repeat the same material again after a year this is a part of my own life drive um, this is a part of my own moving through the phenomenology of spirit um, to recapitulate, the, to understand better the, the drama that's being recapitulated through me. Um, and in that sense, I may never teach the text again, or I'm not going to teach it again soon. It's available on Philosophy Portal in a recorded form for forever, for as long as the site's up. But I'm not just going to repeat. I try not to repeat precisely any lecture I give. Um but I might teach it at a later moment in my spiritual development. And the reason for that being that at a different moment in my spiritual development, I might have a, a new perspective on, on the book. Um, you know, my awareness of my own self notion in the historical process. Um, I feel uh, to expand on that a little bit, I feel as though where I locate myself when I'm reading the contradictions in the phenomenology of spirit is mainly between the spiritual and the, 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 the religious idea. Um, and the, the reason for that is that, let's see. Um, so I say where I perhaps have yet to unfold my spiritual journey is on the level of the religious idea that is on the level of the spiritual community that is t attempting to hold the intensities and tensions of the heart as such. Um, and that's just because, you know, I haven't, I haven't, you know, I, I've, I've sensed into those intensities. I've sensed into those tensions, but I haven't myself concretely been um, a part of such an unfolding um, and, and perhaps that will be a part of my future. Perhaps that will be a part of my own imminent development. And, and certainly it's a, it's an aspect of my current development in, in, in a certain way, but, um, I still feel like there's parts of myself that I'm, I'm working through in that, in that dimension. And so it could be in the future that my reading of the phenomenology of spirit would be impacted by such a new perspective on myself and on, on consequently this work. So I want to emphasize that. Um, at the same time, I want to emphasize that I, I do believe I was able to offer the students of philosophy portal deep insight into those categories. It's just that, you know, at a different moment of my being, perhaps there will be a new uh, perspective from, from myself on those, on those categories. Um, uh, I do also want to add that I, I think yeah, that my perspective after, you know, having moved through a PhD and also moving through the phenomenology of spirit, I do think this text has been misunderstood by contemporary academics and misapplied in the context of, in the contemporary of the academic world and intellectual world, where it, it seems that many people run around on the level of self-consciousness, namely a desire for recognition or reason in terms of external cognitive mapping of either the cosmos or the mind without the slightest clue as to the spiritual and the religious dimensions of the phenomenological drama, of course, in the context of the culture I grew up in, it was very, I think, new atheist. And, and um, these dimensions of the drama were, I think, often played out unconsciously. And I think they often distort processes which are consciously thought of as objective scientific practices, but which are actually being distorted by other dimensions of spirit, which are um, not... Um, worked through, not recapitulated in, in, inside of the singularity of, of, of their being. Um, at the same time, I do think that there is a necessity and there is a meaning of opening up a post-Hegelian space. I don't think we should just all read the phenomenology of spirit and then that's it, that's over. Far from it, it's, it's more of something that I think is a starting point, which can then be used as an opening onto a other field. And that's a field that I engage with personally. I'm right now leading a course on Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. 
but I also have been inspired by figures like Sigmund Freud, Jacques Lacan, and Slavoj Žižek, among others, um, and have led courses on them. And I think that they, um, and of course, there are many others, and it's a, it's a big field. This is just sort of my personal moving through these figures. But um, uh, I also offer this quote from, from Žižek in terms of how I sort of understand um, the repetition of Hegel and the meaning of the repetition of Hegel. Um, and, and basically what this quote, you can read it yourself, but uh, the, basically the quote is, the paradox of Deleuze's mission of, um, uh, you know, building his philosoph philosophical career as a thought experiment as if Hegel didn't exist, Zizek saying, Deleuze's pure repetition only works as a weird sublation of Hegel. So it, it's kind of as if, if we repeat Hegel and then as a working through, you know, he, he says here, we can only afford to ignore Hegel after a long and arduous working through Hegel. And that's why the time has, has come to repeat Hegel. I think this work, I shared that quote because I think this work is that. This, this work is offering that. Um, this anthology, you know, if you're looking for this, this is what this anthology is offering. Um, uh, so not a, not a universal identification with Hegel, but a universal working through Hegel uh, could provide... Um, I think, great deal of collective insight um, as the world becomes transformed by the efforts of a mostly subjectless scientism. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I just, I just sort of say that this anthology, um, I do think that it, it, it offers us um, help in thinking about post-Hegelian issues, namely existentialism, political economy, the heights of becoming psychological symptoms and the peculiarity of being human for for spirit today. So I think that's, um, uh, now my highlighter is not working. Now I'm not going to take you through Daniel's paper because that's, that's, that would be his, his to, to explain. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but, um, he does say here, uh, he was trying to go for a community vibe, a community of people as, as opposed to a collection of voices. And I do think we lived up to that notion. Um, uh, and that's that's also, I think, in his spirit, and I think that's in his, he really brings that to the table, and I think that that's reflected in the um, book. And also that the, the book is structured by the idea of the Hegel event by Alexander Bard, that Hegel is a philosophical event, which post-Hegelian philosophy has consciously or unconsciously labored with, and, and it's time to make that more conscious. It's time to make that more conscious, and this anthology hopes to um, point in that direction and and play its part in that uh, in that way and that's why Daniel ends this uh, editor's note by saying Hegel dreamed us I think that's a nice way of saying it and here we strive to honor him by being the nothing in the dialectic in which he is everything and so that's the gesture of the universal working through you know, we submit to him as a ma master, but in Zizekian terms, we know that a master is a vanishing mediator. And, and we try to treat him in this way. And, and, and in the context of our life drive, hopefully that is how it will unfold. So I'll just take you quickly through the articles that you'll find in the anthology. It starts off with Alexander Bard, who's a, a philosopher in his own right, who's written uh, Synthism, Digital Libido with Jan Sörkvist, as well as many others, and we're working on a book at the moment. And the Hegel event is his introduction, and he's just introducing us here to a massive shift in Western philosophy, which I think it's important, and the time has come for Westerners to better understand what this shift is about. And I think that um, the introduction by Bard here is... Um, it's just a good naming of what we are responding to. Um, and that that's also connected to Bard's deeper philosophy, namely his next book, which will be called Process and Event, uh, this event as a rupture in the normal order of things, which retroactively changes everything. And, and Hegel is such a figure um, uh, for Bard and, and for the rest of the um, writers in this anthology. Next, there's a paper by Chitan Anand, who's a doctoral researcher and a social scientist in India. And he wrote uh, Meditations on Self-Consciousness in Hegel. So he offers a window into a small aspect 
of the phenomenology of spirit, namely the chapter on self-consciousness. And he brings this Hegel's idea of self-consciousness to some of the contradictions of contemporary theory and practice. And one of the interesting things that he does in, in, in bringing this to uh, the contradictions of theory and practice, note that you can see here the way in which Hegel is useful. Um, He's, he's coming to a contemporary problem, but he's coming to it through the lens of a particular contradiction, which Hegel art unfolds for us in, in the chapter on self-consciousness. And this is the tendency of theory and practice to fall into a totalizing relationship with each other, either all theory or all practice. And this is impossible in Hegel. And so you can't have a complete theory. You can't have a totalizing theory. And you also can't do practice without theory. Theory has to inform practice and, and, and vice versa. Um, he also works towards thinking Hegel's notion of negativity uh, as an intensive dimension, which uh, he's highlighting this concept of intensity in a very interesting way um, at, through the history of philosophy from Kant to Deleuze. Um, and in bringing our attention to the intensive dimension, he is... Um, not only breaking the subject object duality or even the theory practice duality, but he's bringing attention to the fact that what our theories and practices are about are in some sense, um, an attempt to, to work through, to explore the intensive dimension, um, the intensities of our being, um, and so he emphasizes that here with an affirmation of the negative force that constitutes the theory practice divide um, and then thinking multiplicity in this light. And I think that that's Chitin here is a great example of someone who um, understands Deleuze well, namely his thinking in terms of multiplicities and intensities, but brings the negative dimension of Hegelian self-consciousness into the picture. And this changes the way in which we read Deleuzean multiplicity and the intensive dimension. And um, it's, it's an example, another example, um, well, maybe the first in, in this paper where um, we see the way in which starting with Hegel allows you to see, in this case, Deleuze in a, in a, in a different light. Next, Quinn Whelan uh, wrote a fantastic article on Buddhism um, and the relationship between Buddhist logic and Hegel's logic. And um, very quickly, I wanna just say that the, the crucial notion here in Quinn's paper is the way in which Buddhist logic runs into a fixation on negation, whereas in Hegel's logic, there's a negation of the negation. And this negation of the negation um, opens up a deeper um, understanding of the process of becoming, which becomes so important in post-Hegelian philosophy. Um, and so here where I think Chitan and Quinn's paper link thematically is Chitan is bringing our attention to the intensive dimension and Quinn is bringing our attention to this process of becoming, which um, can become intense. So, um, and also I think it's a good reading of the way in which there is really a break in Western modern philosophy, which is not reducible or sublatable by pre-modern mystical spirituality. Next, Dimitri uh, Kroymans, uh writes a chapter on Hegelian Tantra, and this is informed by his own experience um, working with tantric um, sexuality, and um, also his, of course, his own reading through Hegelian phenomenology of spirit. And I think he does a really good job of both um, bringing tantric, bringing Hegel to tantric practices, um, in emphasizing the importance of absolute knowing, um, also emphasizing the importance of, of Hegelian philosophical concepts like the non-relation. Um, but he also brings tantra to Hegel, namely the emphasis on the experimenting with sexuality and experimenting with your own spirituality through sexuality. A lot of the times we can bypass sexuality um, so whether or not it's exploring Tantra or whether or not it's exploring Hegelian philosophy, he tries to put these two forms, which are often not thought together into a type of conversation with each other, not in a way that they 
totally subsume one another, but in a way in that they gain something that they didn't have before the thoughtful meditation. Next, Max Mackin is uh, writing about Hegel's critique of Kant. And basically here we go through a reading of the history of realism um, from, from Aristotle up to Hume um, and Kant. And there's this tendency towards subjectivism, which is reached in, in, in Kant's work. And uh, ultimately, it's Hegel's response to Kant's subjectivism, which opens up the possibility for a new idea about objectivity, namely an objectivity which can include cognition and spirit and subjectivity within it. And, and that's really the, 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 the main point, which brings us to the next chapter, which is completely linked, um, which is Hegel's concept of realism. Um, and specifically here, Jason Bernstein works through the, uh, Hegel's concept of, of realism, also demonstrating the way in which uh, Hegel differentiates himself from Kant in terms of the subject-object division, um, the difference between thought and being, um, and also, of course, emphasizing that Hegel brings together thought and being in the phenomenology of spirit and, and tries to understand the relationship between truth and knowledge. Um, and, and that ultimately what is at stake in Hegel's realism is um, really including us, including subjectivity into the objective picture, uh, how he ends here, the role we humans play in reality itself. Next, Boris A. is analyzing um, the role of mutual recognition in a psychoanalytic inspired way. Um, he is um, interested in the way in which the dynamics of recognition, particularly the, through the infant and the mother or the infant and the caregivers, um, regulates dynamics of, of, of recognition in the subject's perspective um, and seeks to demonstrate the way in which there's an overlap or a harmony between Hegel's theory of recognition and psychoanalysis and one of the areas in which psychoanalysis melds with philosophy. And I think that has become such a productive intersection for contemporary philosophy that it's, you know, it's a, it's a rich topic. And, and, and if you haven't been exposed to this harmony yet, um, it is uh, one that will open up many rabbit holes, so to speak. Um, it's one of the most, again, one of the most productive intersections in, in contemporary philosophy. Next, Raza Ali uh, writes about the perpetuity of the letter. Um, and he's focusing on not necessarily any of the categories or forms that Hegel uses, as I've already mentioned these, these categories, but rather focusing on the dialectics, rather focusing on dialectical processes um, and applying it to symbolic language. Um, he's interested in the way in which um, abstraction plays a role in our, in our self-consciousness and the way of our, our processes of coming to be. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, you can't get outside of language, you cannot get outside of the symbolic, which many mystical pre-modern forms assume you can. Um, this is a deceptive move uh, in Hegelian philosophy. And also, uh, Raza was able to show the way in which this allows sort of, apart from the specific forms explicated in the phenomenology of spirit, brings one to the simplicity of uh, absolute knowing. Uh, as he ends here, absolute knowing is the simple notion that finally knows itself as notion and takes it, takes itself up as simple. Um, but this is all within processes of coming to be within abstraction. It's important to note. James Wisdom then writes a paper about art um, titled A Black Square. And he is interested in the idea of the, the, the notion that art is complete in itself. Um, and interested in analyzing the role of the black square on a, right, on, on a white surface as um, a representation of the subject's movement through abyssal negativity, moving through a zero point, moving through what Slavoj Žižek and, and Jacques Lacan will call subjective destitution um, as a way to bring about something new. Um, and so he sees this... this um, piece of art, the black square, the famous black square, as a, a, a representation of that subjective destitution. Um, the so he, he says here, the spirit is artist, is Hegel's claim of the becoming of spirit in the absolute as 
death, that death, death is the master in, in, in Hegel. Um, so, but at the same time, this is the tremendous power of the subject that by facing this negativity, by tarrying with this negativity of death, as wisdom says here, tearing itself asunder and going through the process of negating the negation, um, it, it can realize itself uh, in a way that a subject who has never moved through that process would be able to realize themselves. Um, it's 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 an it's it's a, a very nice a very nice article very nice reflection. Um, next, Alex Ebert wrote about the sublation of mathematics, and and this is a very ambitious work, and I think it comes out um, really well. Um, as as someone who deviates from most of the other um, writers, he's inspired primarily by the science of logic in this in this piece. And he's interested in demonstrating the way in which Hegel's central concept, that of sublation, um, is a useful concept when we think about mathematical concepts, which are post-Hegelian, like the real numbers, isomorphism, uh, sinusoidal waves, um, which he claims none of which have been mathematically established in connection in this way. Um, he goes on to say, let me see here, well, Ah, so, you know, in this, in this dichotomy between being and becoming status and flux or the one and the many, he claims this revised understanding of Hegel's sublation shows that each to be an emergent property of its, of its own opposite. So he's, he's saying here we cannot become fixated or stuck on either one concept or the other, being or becoming stasis or flux, but they require it themselves a, a dialectical uh, treatment um, and that this has relevance for... Uh, mathematics, namely, uh, he says here, the emergence of Cartesian space itself, where we are, uh, you know, um, oftentimes doing mathematical work. Next, Daniel Garner wrote a, a piece called The Absolute Choice, which is again inspired by not the phenomenology of spirit, by the philosophy of right, but he um, manages to connect it to the phenomenology of spirit. Um, you know, the main thing here is that we have two different Hegels, a, a Hegel where the true is the rational and a Hegel where the true isn't the rational. And Daniel uses these uh, notations of A equals A and A equals B basically as representations of contradictory identity or paradoxical identity, um, demonstrating that in order to, for rationality to really become rational in order for rationality to become actual i should say that there is a non-rational choice um and that that you have to feel this in your bones that you have to feel this in your everyday world and that it's 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 counterintuitive and i think that it, it does stand up because hegel is a a great thinker of counterintuitive thought because hegel of course starts the phenomenology of spirit by saying that intuition unmediated is a a, a trap for thought and it's 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 a dead end and and that it, it it's it's it prevents one from becoming rational um so I, I think this is where i would make sense of of daniel's work and then finally uh my paper um is called the necessity of absolute knowing and i am basically writing this to the universe of new atheism i'm writing this to the universe of where we have no, we have moved beyond god we have moved beyond traditional understandings of religion but we find ourselves with problems in the scientific world related to including the subject um, within scientific modeling. Um, we have troubles with um, untested subjectivity subjects, which, which basically have a great understanding of external substance, but don't have a good understanding of themselves. And also an emphasis on problems of democracy and rational cognition, which do not have which are falling into crises of meaning and authority and without obvious solutions within democracy and rational cognition itself. And I think I read Hegel's absolute knowing chapter as very useful for these problems, namely the problem of including subjectivity within scientific models, um, making sure that subjects test themselves as spirit throughout their coming to be, and also recognizing that democracy and rational cognition 
run into dead ends, which do not have solutions within their form, but rather we need new form. Um, and, and I could connect that back to other papers here, um, but that's sort of my offer in this, um, in this work. And that I think is the, yeah, that is the, the free preview. So uh, if you are interested in checking it out, uh, this was a labor of love, which has been going on throughout the year. It's the first major work of, of Philosophy Portal. Uh, it's my first attempt to not only lead a, a, a philosophy class, but also to produce a collective work with that class. And I think it's something that's rare in the sense that it doesn't often happen in, in university settings where students are able to also creatively contribute at the end of the course and also to produce a work with their classmates and with the, with the professor um, in a way that we are all basically on equal footing and in a collective dialogue and um, all seeking to push beyond ourselves. And um, so I would just say as a last note, um, if you are looking to challenge yourself philosophically, if you're looking to um, think about some of these ideas about becoming sexuality, um, you know, theory and practice, uh, Eastern spirituality, religion, um, abstraction, you know, psychoanalysis, um, atheism. Um, these are some of the major themes that will come up in the anthology. And uh, I really think it is, again, worth the, uh, deserves the endorsement that it received from, from Slavoj Žižek. And I'm really happy with how it turned out. So thank you for staying with me if you've watched all this way through. And um, and check out uh, Enter the Alien. Link in the description, and uh, of course, leave a leave a comment on Amazon. It's very helpful. If you, uh, the more people we have supporting Philosophy Portal, um, and uh, and 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 um, sort of uh, concretely um, contributing to um, its building its reputation and building its foundation and it's 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 very much appreciated so so thank you for your thank you for your time